Uh, so, let me uh, write down the um, sequence of things we have been doing and then you can see. So, uh, me so far is that uh, we defined the quant quantum mechanics through path integral. which actually meant through transition amplitudes but we basically checked that this gives correct kernel for the free particle. Now, from this point on, we introduce this method of uh, uh, external current. or forcing function. And this is a method, there is no real forcing function. So, this is method of forcing function, which will later become external current. this is Schwinger's way of thinking of it. We also made a transition from transition amplitude to vacuum to vacuum amplitude. Okay. Again a concept essentially due to Schwinger. Vacuum to vacuum amplitude is apparently a fake thing because why would you, what would you learn from going from vacuum to vacuum? Uh, it is like being back to square one. But the point is that in fact the vacuum to vacuum amplitude is done in the presence of the forcing function. So, you get a vacuum to vacuum amplitude in the presence of as a function of this auxiliary variable and then by varying this variable you can obtain all the information back. Okay. So, but this is as a function of functional of the forcing function. And that is the key thing that you obtain the vacuum to vacuum amplitude in terms of the forcing function and then this force W of j becomes the generating function, generating functional of point functions or green functions.
So that is what we have done so far. What we so we can say what happens is that we do um, omega plus infinity, omega minus infinity to be equal to integral over dqf dqi of omega plus uh, so omega infinity qf tf times the more physically transparent transition amplitude right this is obvious getting uh, and in the presence of a current j with this what did we call it f over there yeah f so vacuum to vacuum amplitude in the presence of f basically takes this form and then this becomes we saw in the limit that we take t and uh, this here we take t f t i to also infinity infinity and minus infinity we basically recover plus i the basic path integral is with i integral minus infinity to infinity dt of uh, whatever the action is we have been writing in terms of q q dot t but plus i times integral q t j of t uh, f of t now at this point itself we can observe that if we define correlation functions as not phi I am sorry q t 2 q t 1 as equal to um, 1 over i d by d f t 2 1 over i d by d f t 1 of that transition amplitude. And evaluated at f equal to 0. This is uh, all we did so far effectively uh, except for the calculation method of uh, doing quadratic integrals to recast the path integral in various ways and of course we will be using it again and again. We also use the stationary phase method to check that the path integral has to become stationary on the classical path. So but other than that this is all there is and if you have n points then you put n of those and then you can recover the answer. There is an illusion among people that path integral is a good thing to do quantum mechanics. This is completely wrong. The main use of path integral is only if you, after you make transition to quantum field theory and then 
to derive relations between Green's functions. So, QFT again has been used primarily as an S matrix theory. The only thing we do, so we tell everybody to get them excited that we are calculating endpoint functions, but what we really have in mind is calculating scattering of n particles. So, all we do is uh, there is a very formal procedure which then converts the endpoint function into the endpoint S matrix, n particle S matrix. So, we, we calculate those transition amplitudes, the S matrix and not necessarily energy uh, stationary states. So, in fact, QFT fails completely, I should not say completely, but QFT has not proved to be very useful to compute any bound states nor is path integral very useful. I know that there is there are several textbooks, entire textbooks written on how path integral is very useful in quantum mechanics. Well, you can read them for their own value whatever they have, but I have never read them and uh, I can vouch that no chemist will need them to calculate the many electron bound states. Okay. The chemists do use however, the Green's function ideas because they want, so Green's function ideas make it a little bit more formal and uh, peg it on a slightly different level, but uh, path integral is not going to be. So, the only computation you can really do with path integral is the Gaussian integral and later we will see that it helps you to derive the so called diagrams. So, so called wick contraction at two point functions at a time, but there is uh, the kind of power that you have in a partial differential equation, which allows you to solve, I mean hope for getting exact solutions for many different potentials that does not exist in quantum field theory. And in quantum field theory, so primary use of uh, this method has been to calculate S matrix elements. If you want to calculate, so the, I can even write it down here. How should I say? Uh, becomes most useful
So this beta salpeter functional equation has uh, has been studied by a lot of people and a lot of work exists. But I don't think that, I mean we were never taught that it so calculates baryon. And if it was, then we would be not doing lattice gauge theory. So that is the status. But we can also say the other use of the functional formalism is in fact to implement this theory on the lattice. You can implement quantum theory on the lattice uh, in this functional formalism. So for lattice gauge theory also it is a useful thing, but lattice gauge theory is then just a completely numerical calculation. It is Monte Carlo calculation of that functional integral because there is no the only approximation schemes or the only exact calculation schemes available is the Gaussian integral or the so called steepest descent method in some approximation you can uh, it is like the stationary phase we will see it. So there are very few tricks available at the functional level that allow you any kind of quote answer, but this trick does allow you to obtain functional relationships the trick of uh, partition function trick of your partition function uh, in thermo uh, in statistical mechanics also one uses something similar so that is really the all there is to it okay but it is extremely powerful for the purpose for which we are going to do it the conversion from green's function to s matrix is itself quite a formal statement but once you get over it, you get used to the idea. It is not all that difficult. Hopefully, I will be able to do it if I have the time. There is a two, I think. So we have to interpret this as product over all E. Um, where you have to order the E's, the energy spectrum because the path integrals are always ordered. And that was one thing I was going to comment here, I forgot. Where we wrote this Green's function, um, we actually end up calculating only the time ordered product. So it is automatic in path integral that you will get the functional method that you will get the time ordered product. So this is the W0 and the W which is not of much interest anymore um, and the other part in detail is Well, let me see if I can say it without.
the only thing is the sign in D and it is not square root because ok so T1 minus T2 there is a minus sign right the square root is in the Fourier transform definition but here it is not there and E squared minus omega squared plus I epsilon yeah right so everyone knows all this and you know that this boils down to um, theta so where should we write okay. I <coughs> E will be equal to omega so I omega T and plus theta of T2 minus T1 times E raise to plus I omega T think the, uh, there is a 1 over 2 I omega from the poles right so yeah. because it is square you will be taking E plus omega E minus omega and each one is a pole. So, from each of the poles you get each of the poles is relevant depending on whether this is greater or that is greater than 0 and the value of the pole is that the 2 pi goes in the integration ok in the contour integral thinking and it was a great discovery when Feynman used this propagator that positive frequency particles go forward in time. So, omega is a positive number it is positive square root of the omega squared. So, it gets a minus sign which we which is the correct time evolution according to Schrodinger uh, convention of setting energy operator to be equal to plus i d by d t. So, with the minus i it gives correct omega. So, this is going forward in time but this would give negative energy or would go backward in time and that is the interpretation. Uh, I, if this has not been told you before I might as well spend a little time here telling you about uh, is going forward and backward because this is at the uh, heart of causality in quantum field theory. So, <coughs> is the uh, or it should be there in so this is a very general argument and the way uh, Weinberg puts it particularly is that so look at the uncertainty principles uncertainty principle there would be four statements but look at uh, say de by d e d t uncertainty principle. if you try to but in relativity it is not delta t and delta x that really matter because one person's t is another person's uh, mixture of t and x uh, and actually Weinberg writes a, a so called uncertainty principle which is written like this. So, it basically says that the space time interval between two observations has to remain greater than the Compton wavelength ok. So, you can think of this you can put the m on this side and treat it as if it is uh, well not really, but this is the form in which uh, it is written in his book and you can see what that, that what this is saying is that you can have single particle interpretation only provided you do not probe the object in space time intervals that are smaller than uh, the Compton wavelength ok. So,
delta E delta P no so we I meant to say delta T square minus delta X square yeah but now <coughs> in quantum mechanics you could you could always probe the system more closely and then you will lose the single particle interpretation as you have been taught probably in it most relativistic quantum mechanics courses emphasize that you will create particles if you probe at uh, this length scales close shorter than this then the value of delta e and delta e will have to be larger than the mass scale of the particle and you will end up creating more particles and the single particle interpretation will be lost but we also have a more specific inter more specific statement suppose that i have a creation of a particle so now we draw this space time diagram and the light cone normally if you create a particle here it will be later found here right so this is t1 and t2 so it will propagate from this to this but quantum mechanics only tells you some inequalities it does not say delta x cannot be less than something or delta t all that you have to is do is maintain this but if this happens you could also have a situation where t1 is here and t2 is here okay so t1 prime uh, i don't want so i'll remove the old t1 t2 so suppose it is t1 and t2 like this this may not be forbidden by this relation because all i have to do is adjust that the delta t square is bigger than uh, minus delta x square remains bigger than uh, this m square and well actually it will be negative in that case but because i don't have control in quantum mechanics it may very well happen that i create a particle here but destroy over there this is the also say bell inequality thing you do something here and it gets also it determines something over there so the point is that we recover the uh, causality correctly in this case because it is possible for you to here the events are space like separated so it is always possible to at least reverse the time okay uh, for space like separated events it is possible to reorient this is a little uh, let us see how does one recover uh, i'd have to really tilt it a lot until the projection onto that axis reverses the directions of t1 and t2 right if it is a space like separated interval then i can uh, and if i choose my new axis to be like this then now i have to do a projection parallel to this axis so this will go so i i have to make the slope of this bigger than this so sorry so i do this and this so this is t1 and this is t2 right clear t1 t2 but now and this has a slope like this so i do draw a new choice of axes which is highly relativistic so it is approaching the light cone very thin close to light cone if i now project these by drawing lines parallel to this they will go and hit the time axis in the reverse order intersected it already right so the time yeah correct and uh, this one from 
here to draw like this until we hit this axis okay. uh, already there yeah. So if you will do this carefully in your notebook you will see that the projections which are this is the new x prime axis the projections projection lines parallel to x prime axis which go and hit t prime axis the t1 and t2 are reversed I mean the well known result and you can find the algebraic expression for the Lorentz boost required for this to happen. So now there is a question of causality that you emit a particle here but absorb it here which is at a later time in this frame of reference. In the other frame of reference it will look as if it got emitted first and got absorbed later. This problem is solved by a quantum field theory because of this because in the other frame of reference it will look like an opposite charge particle went backward in time okay that is what the interpretation is. So for a charge system Q plus Q created at T1 and uh, absorbed at T, T2 is equivalent to minus Q created at T2 and absorbed at T1. So this amounts to the T1 location reducing its charge in both the things what is same is thus both the charge of one is reduced and and that of two is increased. In the per, per person who is observing frame of reference as his clock is ticking, he considers time sequence as going forward in time strictly. And in if the two events due to the this uncertainty, in some this is what I meant to suggest. In some space time region, well actually it will not be a circle but some kind of hyperboloid. Uh, when so long as this is of the order of m anything can happen here in particular a particle can get produced and uh, annihilated at space like separated points and if that happens with a particular time sequence and if it is space like separated in another one it will look like uh, creation event is happening after the destruction event well that is not true because it will be uh, in his frame in the other observer's frame of reference it will be interpreted as minus q sequentially got created at t2 prime which in this frame of reference occurs before t1 prime we will find that if you compute the uh, for a massive field if so For massless fields we will find that the support is only on the light cone. So if you are sitting at you start with the origin as the reference the Green's function the Feynman uh, propagator will have support only on the light cone only on these points outside of that it vanishes. But if you do it for a massive particle then you find some slightly different function which has of course uh, higher support here but it also has a little tail outside it is not strictly on the light cone it is a exponentially dying tail just like in a barrier problem barrier problem the wave function penetrates under the barrier. So in quantum field theory the two point Green's function will actually protrude uh, into the uh, 
classical relativity forbidden zone, but exactly of the order of the Compton wavelength and not more. And if things happen in that region, so if you see creation destruction events in that region, they will be resolved by this explanation. 